Hello, and a big welcome here tonight, and indeed, Happy New Year, as it's the first 5x50 of 2022. And what better way could we kick off than having Stephen Fry talk to Johan Hari about his extraordinary new book, Lost Focus. What is happening to our ability to concentrate? That's the question that Johan is asking. Indeed, even to our ability to focus for short periods of time. What are the causes? How do we get it back? Actually, does it matter? Johan's the author of two best-selling books, Chasing the Scream, The First and Last Days of the War on Drugs, and then Lost Connections, Uncovering the Real Causes of Depression and Its Unexpected Solutions. He's a hugely popular TED talker and both his books are now in development for TV or film. Everyone who encounters his work comes away with nothing but praise and also he makes you rethink an awful lot of assumptions that you've had and long held beliefs. So I don't think this could be a more important book at a more important time. Joining him is the wonderful and the legendary Stephen Fry, whose CV would actually take this entire hour to read <laughs> it. So suffice it to say, <laughs> he is a national treasure. He's our national treasure and he's probably well, I think it's fair to say he's probably the cleverest of that very elite group. He writes, he acts, he hosts, he thinks, he talks, and he has genuinely enriched the lives of everybody who's been lucky enough to encounter him. Lost Focus is a particular interest of his, and we're so delighted he's here tonight to explore the subject with Johan. Simple format, they're going to talk for around 40 minutes, and then I'll take and field the questions that you send in. So please put your questions into the Q&A box, and I promise we'll get to as many as we can. Stephen's latest book is Fry's Ties, uh, but that all his others are still out there. Mythos is a particular favourite of mine. So please um, know that they're, both books are available from Newham Books and the details will be in the chat. And just now sit back, enjoy it, and I'm going to hand you over to the very capable hands of Stephen Fry. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rosie, for that charming and rosy introduction. I wish I were worthy of it. Um, now, hello, everybody, and thanks for tuning in. Um, most of you won't have had the opportunity to read this fascinating book, Stone Focus. I have, so I'm uh, h h hoping to help you uh, through it, as indeed Johan will be. But I'll just start uh, by saying, coming up quite honestly and saying that I enjoyed it enormously, and it raised many questions. And like the best books of its kind, I didn't agree with everything. I was puzzled by some assertions and ideas that didn't strike me as credible. And yet it's very thoroughly researched and is filled, if you want to go online to the footnotes and the research notes, probably more than any book of its kind. So there's a lot of hard work behind it and it tells a very alarming story. And I think the first question I'll put to you, Johan, is that most of us are agreed that the Pandora's box of social media has, has thrown out a lot of terrible things that we probably never predicted, or certainly fools like me who welcomed the technology never predicted. Um, and we can look towards whatever people want to call cancel culture, trolling, uh, abuse, and misinformation, and so on. And these are things that it's kind of understood are terrible about social media, but it's one of the biggest players in the game that you tell us is being played in distracting people, in, in helping us lose our focus, or in fact, stealing it, because the title is Stolen Focus, isn't it? Now, would you say that that is the main cause of our problem, technology, or is it something else? Yeah, essentially, I just want to say before we start that, um... I'm so chuffed to be talking to you, Stephen, because reading you from when I was so young really gave me a sense of what someone can be in the world. And your writing, your your, your work, it, I can't, it inspired me so deeply. And I think in a sort of weird way, if we did an It's a Wonderful Life scenario where you had never been born, I would just be a very different person because oh, your way of being in the world just inspired me. I think there's a handful of public figures, basically you, Oprah and Noam Chomsky, if you've never <laughs> been born, I would just be a very different kind of person. I want, One day oh. I'll persuade you, you all to come together. Um, so uh, I, I'm just so, so chuffed. And anyone, if anyone's watching and thinking, you know, Stephen Fry seems really nice, but in private, he's even nicer <laughs> behind scenes. So I'm so, so chuffed to, to, to be with you. And it was so interesting for me, that question, 
because when I started working on the book, um, it was just for a very personal reason, as you know, and I'm really interested to talk to you about your attention because you're so interesting about this. Um, for me, so just as I say that, I'm thinking, I've just remembered the It's a Wonderful Life sketch you did where about <laughs> Rupert <Yeah>. Murdoch. <laughs> Do you want to just explain that for people who don't know that? Sorry, it's well, something about it's a very separate thing, but Hugh Laurie and I did a parody of It's a Wonderful Life in which um, <laughs> Rupert Murdoch is standing on the bridge, played by Hugh, saying, if my life is over, it's meaningless, I want to die, and he's about to throw himself over, and I play Clarence, and I dive in, and he saves me, and I say, but you're wonderful, it's a wonderful life, I'm going to show you your life, and we see his life where he takes over various companies and newspapers and, and trashes them and makes them vulgar and aggressive <laughs> and bullying, and in the end, and Clarence pushes Murdoch <laughs> off the bridge. It's a very, very silly piece of so, no, it's but genius. Anyway, it's that's... absolutely genius. But that's just, yeah. So hmm. um, sorry, it just came into my head there. But the the so I had noticed that my own ability to focus and pay attention was just getting worse and worse. It felt like with each year that passed, things that required deep focus, like reading a book, watching long films, things that are so deep to my sense of self, were just getting more and more like running up a down escalator. And I could see this happening to so many people I knew, particularly the young people that I love. And it was really an incident with, with a young person that I love that led to this, perhaps we'll talk about. But, yeah. but so I was really locked in a psychology where I basically thought there were two causes. I thought I didn't have enough willpower and I thought the smartphone just was invented and ruined my attention. So when I went on this big journey for the book all over the world from Miami to Melbourne to Moscow and in fact to places that don't begin with the letter M as well <laughs> I, I went to I don't know why I became all alliterative there um I interviewed over 200 of the leading experts in the world about what causes focus to get better and what causes it to get worse and I learned that there's scientific evidence for loads of factors that are making our attention significantly worse that this is not some individual failure of willpower it's not even one new invention it's a very broad problem. And this is why, you know, the book has that title, your attention did not collapse, your attention has been stolen from you. And what surprised me is I thought, oh, when I moved beyond thinking it was purely an individual problem, I thought, okay, this is gonna be mostly about tech. Actually, what surprised me is tech is only one of the 12 causes, it's actually not the biggest. And the factors that are invading our attention when it comes to tech are quite specific and can be fixed. Um, I can talk more about that if you like, but. Um, mm. I'm really curious about your attention, Stephen, if you don't mind me asking you. No, but... It's very good. And you make a comparison at, at one point in your book that uh, chimed with me immensely. And that is in the same way that we tend to blame ourselves if we are no longer as capable of concentrating or we have days or weeks in which we don't seem to focus as much as we'd like to. Uh, we naturally blame ourselves. And in the same way, when we put on weight, we blame ourselves. And, you know, there's an element in which we're right. We, we could bring all our will to bear to focus better and we could bring all our will to bear to eat better but society and the the weather around us uh drives us towards the kind of food that is most likely to put on weight and not only it's not only the technology of food processing in the same way in our analogy it's not only the technology of social media it's also uh, the the stress the anxiety all the other problems, indeed, even pollution and things like that, that lead us to a state where psychologically stuffing our faces seems uh, seems the natural way to cope. And it's <laughs> interesting that this January, a lot of the adverts for weight loss are now towards the the end of ones that are supposed to deal with your psychology rather than lay down a diet. And this is a way that it's going. And that's so in, interesting. Yeah. That's fascinating, Stephen, because that was a moment when the direction of the book really changed for me. Because mm -hmm. so our attention is being invaded by these 12 deep forces, which range very widely from some aspects of our technology to the food we eat, to the hours we don't sleep, to the work we do. There's a really broad range. But there was I was still very locked in this individualistic way of thinking about it. And there was a moment it started to unlock for me, and it was exactly about the obesity analogy. I went to interview Professor Joel Nigg, who's one of the leading experts in the world on children's attention problems. I interviewed him in Portland in Oregon. And he said to me that we need to start asking if we live in what he called an attentional pathogenic environment, an environment in which every, and it's a chilling phrase, isn't it? In, an environment in which it's becoming harder for everyone to focus. And it was precisely the obesity analogy that he drew when he said, look, the average, if you look at a picture of a beach, 
1970, in Britain, the United States, anywhere, almost everyone is what we would call slim or buff, right? You look at me, yeah. it, it seems yeah. very odd when you look at them. Mm. Um, and it's not that the fat people like me were hiding at home, it's that there was almost no obesity in 1970. And then there's been an explosion. So since 1960, the average American has gained 22 pounds. And Professor Nick said to me, that's not because we all became, you know, the stigmatizing things that are said about overweight people, that they're lazy and so on. That's because there were profound changes in the way we live. The entire food supply system changed. That's also had big effects on our attention that maybe we'll talk about. Um, the, we, we built cities that it's very hard to walk and bike around and we became much more stressed. All factors, by the way. That and the only way sense. to shop was to to go by car, not to walk with a basket each day to buy, as my mother used to when I was very young, every day she'd go to a shop and buy the food for the day. So it, she was walking, you know, three miles and back again without thinking that it was the oddest thing to do at all. <laughs> and even washing machines were, were manual and mangles. Almost everything you did had to be done with your physical body involving walking and moving as well as the food being fresher and better. You're so right. And, and there was a moment speaking to him where something fell in place for me because I suddenly thought, oh, so we responded to this. Obesity is a systemic crisis with systemic causes mm. to which we responded by individually torturing ourselves in a way that doesn't yeah. work. Right. As we can see from the fact that the crisis continued to grow. And I suddenly thought I'd obviously read a huge number of the books about attention. I suddenly thought, oh, there's a real risk we're gonna do the same thing with the attention crisis. Mm. That this is a crisis being caused largely for systemic reasons. And yet we are responding with digital diet books. Yes. We're responding by going, it's like someone is pouring itching powder over us all the time. And then that person is leaning forward and saying to us, do you know what mate, uh, you might wanna learn how to meditate, then you wouldn't scratch so much. Yeah. To which you wanna reply, fuck you i'll learn to meditate but yes. you need to stop pouring itching powder on me let, let, let me put this in the way that I, I i was so fascinated to read that that part of your book because i occasionally am asked to speak to companies and in, in the tech field because i've always had an interest mm, in mm. this so i won't mention them that they're one of the largest companies in the world <laughs> i did a zoom with lots and lots of them and i said listen i'm in a position to say this to you and you may feel you'll get in trouble if you obey me but if you feel that the the targets you are given for your work are so extreme and the lack of sympathy and pleasure and empathy and delight you get from your work is dragging you down. Don't accept from your employer that there is a meditation play pod on the campus, as they like to call their <laughs> factory. And it's a workplace, it's an office or a factory, it's not a campus. And it's filled with these ridiculous primary colored, essentially Fisher Price activity nests <clears throat> for adults. And if you've got a problem, you get a free subscription to a, 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 a mindfulness app. Um, and yes, it is like the itching thing, or it's like living in a city with terrible p pollution and being told the solution is to wear an oxygen mask. Exactly. No, that's the solution exactly. is to get rid of the pollution. Exactly. A hundred percent right. And so yeah. that's why, no, you put it beautifully, Stephen, as you always do. And that, that's why in the book I talk about, we've got to tackle this at two levels. There mm. are things we can do as individuals to protect ourselves and our children. There are lots of things you can do in your personal life that will help somewhat, right? I, I've made a lot of changes. Perhaps we can talk about them. I talk about lots in the book and there's lots more that I should make but can't um because i'm struggling with them and i would say those changes have improved my attention by about 20 percent, which is really substantial yes. and worth doing but we've got a level with people and in an environment that is constantly invading your attention you will only get so far through personal action and that's why we've got to have a bigger layer of action we've got to protect ourselves from these forces but then we've got to take on these forces and there's all sorts of really practical ways we can do that in, in the same way that we take on the forces of big coal or big oil in order to solve the the the, the climate change problem is that what you mean exactly exactly that and it, that can seem daunting i never forget dr james williams who had worked for google had been at the heart of the machine was horrified by what they were doing he quit and has become one of the i think the leading expert on attention in the world now and he said to me look the axe existed for 1.4 million years before anyone thought to put a handle on it the <laughs> internet has existed for less than 10,000 days right we can fix a huge number of the factors in it that are invading our attention and for all of the 11 
other causes yes. of, of, um, of attention problems, with, with one exception where I think there's only a systemic solution. There's these two levels where you've got individual solutions and systemic solutions. And sometimes they're posed as opposites. But I just think, obviously, we need to do both, right? Yes, but I think we ought to start to just to go straight back to first mm. principles, really, and to try and describe what we mean by an attention deficit or a distraction surplus, whichever way you want mm. to look at it. Mm. Um, I think most people would agree that there's an epidemic of anxiety amongst the young. We know as a simple, terrible, empirical fact that self-harm amongst children and mm. adolescents is at an all-time high. Indeed, it barely existed when I was at school. The, you know, if you'd said... Someone had said to me, do any of your school friends self-harm? I wouldn't know what they mean. I literally, mm. this idea of cutting, but I've given talks in schools as uh, from Eton to, to, to comprehensives in, in difficult areas, and they've all had the same problem. It doesn't seem to be related to class or income of parents. It, it seems to be a systemic problem of anxiety, upset, and pain amongst children. And as you know, self-harm is... Children, when asked why they do it, they say, in order to stop the pain that's happening in my head. They, they cause a pain in their skin, and it breaks one's heart to think of such a thing. And that's an anxiety and a stress crisis, an unhappiness crisis, um, and, and we can all see that. Um, attention crisis. Well, on the one hand, uh, you can see children so attentive to their machines, to their mm -hmm. devices, that you could say, well, how, how can that be a lack of attention? They are paying so much attention to the video game they're playing, to the TikToks that they're watching, to the um, Instagram pictures that they're swapping, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is huge attention. Um, but it's just attention in a direction that we might think is deleterious. And then there's you and me, who are, you are much younger than me, but you're approaching middle age, and I'm, I'm well it, into it. Science, <laughs> and naturally, as we get older, our attention span probably is not not what it was. Uh, we both try and write from time to time, and we know that in order to write properly, we have to go into that exquisite flow state that that allows time to pass incredibly fast without us noticing and every detail of what we're writing somehow being, you know, you, you write a single word and know instantly that you have to change another one 300 pages earlier because you, you flagged every sort of twitch of the, of the spider's web of your creation. And it's an amazing feeling that you're very privileged to have, but also gardeners have it and painters have it and all kinds of people who do all kinds of things can have this marvelous flow state as it's called and, and you write about that very well but to say that there is a systemic or an endemic or indeed even a pandemic attention problem in the world is needs some explaining i think and perhaps you'd yeah. like to do that and i think if we look at some of the the research on this it's it's very striking you know the, a study by Professor Gloria Marx, who I interviewed, found that the average office worker now focuses on any one task for just three minutes. It's a study by Professor Larry When you Rosen. say now, do they know how much they concentrated on them 10 years ago? So this is a really interesting thing about how we look at longitudinal, longitudinal yeah. evidence about this. Because obviously the ideal would be if starting 100 years ago, people had done the same attention test consistently for a century. Yeah. No one's done that. That data was not gathered. But I do think we can reach reasonable conclusions about how it's getting worse in a few ways. So there are factors that we can prove experimentally and through um, sociological observation massively harm attention. And we know some of those have got worse. So I'll give you a very obvious example, sleep. We sleep yeah. on average an hour less than we did in 1942. Children sleep 85 minutes less than they did a century ago. And there's extremely strong experimental evidence that if you sleep less, you can't pay attention the next day for all sorts of reasons. As Professor Roxanne Prashad explained to me, when you're sleeping, your brain is healing and it's cleaning itself. Yes. If you, if you, if you stay awake for just 19 hours, your attention suffers as badly as if you got legally drunk. And, and not only that, but in a, in, in, in a more chronic sense, uh, lack of sleep can build up amyloid plaques in the brain, exactly. which one of the major causes of dementia. And, and exactly. So Dr. Charles Seisler, who's, who's a real expert on particular on that thing you just talked about, said to me, even if nothing else had changed, even if the only thing that happened is we sleep so much less, that alone would be causing a serious attention crisis. And of course, that's not the only change that's happened. So you yeah. have to consider whether there were any countervailing trends that might have improved our attention. I think there is one big one that I can, maybe two I can talk about. But when we look at these, it's hard to quantify, but when we look at these very big causes, so 
just to give a few examples, we sleep less. The food we eat causes energy spikes and energy crashes, which causes brain fog, which damages your attention. Well, think about something as simple as switching tasks, right? Um, mm -hmm. If, if you are interrupted, Professor Michael Posner at, or at the University of Oregon found, it takes you on average 23 minutes to get back to the same level of focus that you had before you were interrupted. And then the interruption could be By a, a notification. Yeah, uh, text message could be on, any online. form of interruption. Yeah. And yeah. a lot of us are never getting 23 minutes. In fact, the average CEO of a Fortune 500 company only gets 26 uninterrupted minutes a day. So. <laughs> We, we, we're all in the way Professor Earl Miller, one of the leading neuroscientists in the world who I interviewed at MIT, put it to me was, we are living in a perfect storm of cognitive degradation as a result of being interrupted, interrupted, interrupted all the time. You never get to the full level of focus. There was one study, that you, I mean, just think about the wider applicability of this. Professor Larry Rosen did a study. Um, you get a load of students and you split them into three groups and they all watch the same lecture. The first group receives no text messages. The second group receives four text messages. The third group receives eight text messages. And the more texts you got, the worse you did on the test afterwards. If you got eight text messages, I think the figure was you did a whole grade worse. Um, and interestingly, the students knew that. They were asked in advance in various studies by Professor Rosen, how much worse do you think you'll perform if you leave your phone on and you receive texts? And they guessed 30%. And lo and behold, they did in fact perform 30% worse. We know this is being done to us. We're not fools. Um, mm. And the key is about, okay, how do we, A, build personal techniques to protect ourselves, which I talk about a lot, and how do we reduce the amount of the invasion of our, of our attention in the wider environment? We've, we've, we've got to do both. Yes, um, and you, you make a counterintuitive point. What, what one of your... Um... What, yeah, what, what one of your interesting and striking observations is that wool gathering, as it used to be called, daydreaming, going into a brown study, um, losing focus, as it were, and so looking out of the window in the way that school teachers never wanted you to do, is that is a boon, is a good thing. So there's a, a loss of focus, a distraction, a daydream, a letting go. That appears to be beneficial so I, that makes it confusing perhaps. yeah th this really threw me when i first learned about it that um and i'm really curious about because you, you're such a creative and fertile person i'm curious about how this plays out in your own life so because i just couldn't bear this invasion happening to me anymore mm. and i was still in this very individualistic way of thinking i spent three months completely off the internet in a place called Provincetown. You've been to P-Town, haven't you, Stephen? I have, yes. Yes, exactly. So people who don't know Provincetown, it's you want to sense it. It's the gay <laughs> capital else. of humanity. It's the kind of place where more than one person <clears throat> earns a full-time living by dressing as Ursula, the villain from The Little Mermaid, and singing songs about cunnilingus, right? More than one. Um, so I went there for three months with no uh, laptop that could get online and no smartphone. And I went there thinking I've come to massively improve the amount of immediate what's called spotlight focus so you're immediate you narrow your spotlight down to one thing and 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 that happened my ability to read books came back to what it was when i was 17 it was incredible there were some ups and downs but it, it was astonishing to me how much it recovered but i remember about a month into being there so i had i, I couldn't bring my obviously i couldn't actually listen to podcasts so i'd brought my um my iPod, which felt like such a new thing when it was invented and looked like something from the Ark by the time I went to And Every time I turned on my headphones, they would say, searching for Johan's iPhone, searching for Johan's, and they would go, oh, God. iPhone cannot be found. And I was like, oh, it felt always probably sinister. But I remember one day I went for a walk, and you would always go for a walk listening to audiobooks, like I was trying to fatten myself with information. And one day I thought, you know what, I'm going to leave the iPod behind. I'm just going to go for a walk. And I walked down the beach, and I ended up walking for like five hours. And I came back and I felt so fertile. Mm. I'd thought of so many things and I started every day doing it. And at first I was like, well, this isn't why you came here. You came here to focus more. But actually I then went and into, obviously later when I left Provincetown, I interviewed some of the leading experts in the world on mind wandering. And there's been a huge renaissance in the study of mind wandering. Um, and they explained to me, actually you think of mind wandering, letting your, your immediate spotlight relax as losing focus but when you're mind wandering, in fact, it's a different form of attention. Your mind is making sense of the things it's absorbed and processed. It's anticipating the future and making sense of the past. 
that is in fact a form of attention. But at the moment, we're in almost the worst of all possible worlds. We're neither spotlight focused, nor are we mind wandering. We're jammed up. We're jammed up with switching, 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 switching. But I'm curious because you, ha, what space do you make in your life? How do you make space for mind wandering, Steve? Um, I walk, um, and and indeed, I sometimes listen to audio books very often. But I often do um, unplug and and listen to birdsong and uh, and and let my 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 thoughts wander. But I'm a very lucky person, as are you. We are writers. We are supposedly, if not creative people, at least we live by our wits and our mind, and therefore we worry about how our mind is what state it's in and whether it can focus but let it let me put to you that most people are not like us and if you were to say to them how important is concentration focus and attention for you in your life they would stare at you as if you were weird um i'm a shelf stacker at tesco what do you mean uh, while i'm sh stacking shelves i can think about all kinds of stuff or i can listen to music while i'm doing it until i get tapped on the shoulder by my supervisor and told not to listen to music and then i carry on and i chat to people and and then at the end of the day i just want to relax and i want to have a drink and i want to have a smoke and some weed and uh, watch some tv and fall asleep what is this attention that is so vital that i've apparently lost what are you talking about why does it matter and my second point just so you can think about about mm -hmm. it is we do have a longitudinal study of how people behave and that's literature um mm -hmm. so you can read dostoevsky or dickens or um agatha christie uh how does miss marple fill her day she wool gathers she doesn't really um concentrate on things she apparently is very flighty but she thinks um, how does uh, Bob Cratchit fill his day? He works and he makes plans and he dreams. How does Scrooge fill his day, if, you can, if it comes to that? You can look at all these examples we have of lived experience, as the modern, as the modern cliche likes to put it, and see that human beings have always had different ways of thinking. Mrs. Ramsay into the lighthouse in that famous section where she is darning a sock and her mind goes off into hundreds of different corners and thinks about, you know, in the, in the time that, it, you know, five minutes is tw you know, 20 pages of her thoughts. Or indeed, Leopold Bloom in, the, in mm. Ulysses, thinking and thinking, you get a sense of how they, you know, the human mind has always been, it seems, rather as it is now. And why is focus important? It, it, happiness is the desideratum happiness contentment fulfillment a sense that one is being the best one can be according to the standards one sets oneself is what we aim for in life and for some of us that involves having to concentrate on producing a book and focusing on a task at hand in order to be productive but for others sod all that i just want to get on with a happy life focus and concentration are for the swatty kids who want to do maths you know it's so interesting because i thought is you put that brilliantly Stephen. and it's something i've thought about very deeply and i and i discussed with all these kind of people all over the world and i think there's there's many dimensions of the answer but i'll just give a few quick ones what mm. one is i would just say to anyone listening think about anything you've ever achieved in your life whether it's being a good parent, learning to play the guitar, you know, setting up a business. Or if you ask people what they're proud of, it's almost invariably something that required a lot of attention and focus. You know, Miss Marple would say, what are you proud of? She solved a load of murders. That, <laughs> she didn't do that just by doing her will, right? Um, the, the, yeah. Although she would be proud of the, the knitted wool and things as well. <laughs> and, and when your ability to pay attention breaks down, as I think there is good evidence is happening, your ability to achieve your goals of any kind begin to break down. Also, your ability to solve your problems begins to break down. Your ability to be present with other people breaks down. So I think you're right that happiness is a much more important goal than focus. But focus is a tool that gets us to things that can make us have a sense of achievement, a sense mm. of agency. Also, let me just think about something you mentioned before about flow states. Um, <clears throat> So for people who don't know, everyone listening will have experienced a flow state. A flow state is when you're doing something and you really get into it and, you, you know, your sense of time falls away, your sense of ego falls away. And it's really important to the attention debate because it's a way of paying attention that is both the deepest form of attention we can provide and the least effortful. It's not hard when you're in flow. It's easy. Yeah. Uh, it's, it, and and I, so I went to interview Professor Mahali Cheek Semihai, who 
it coined the phrase flow states and spent 50 years studying an amazing man i think i did the last interview he ever did because sadly he died shortly afterwards not due to me i should stress and um don't be sure <laughs> exactly call miss marple sure <laughs> no that's the clue that'll help me but um and and he discovered loads of things about this but that flow is one of the most important factors that make people feel good about their lives and he and I was talking to him a lot about, well, okay, if this is a kind of gusher of flow inside us, how do we drill down into it? How do we get it? And he said many things about this, but for me, I thought there were essentially three things that will really help people. And the first is you have to just choose one goal. If you're, if you're not paying attention, if you're trying to do many things, your attention breaks down. But I'm sorry, your ability to get into flow breaks down. Yeah. You cannot get into flow if you're trying to do lots of things at the same time. If you're trying to paint a canvas, and text someone, flow ain't gonna come. The second is you have to choose a meaningful goal. And the third is it really helps if you choose something that's at the edge of your comfort zone, at the edge of your ability. It's one of the many things I've always admired about you is you're always doing these things that are at the edge of your ability. You're pushing yourself. You don't just do the same. It'd be very easy for you to just do the same things you were doing in your twenties. You would still be fabulously successful. You're always doing this thing at the edge of your comfort zone. So if you think about that, Professor Chiksat Mihai uh, showed that Having regular flow states is profoundly important for feeling happy, for feeling effective in the world. And if your attention is broken and you're being constantly distracted, you just don't get those flow states, anything like as much. So I think there are lots of dimensions of focus and attention that profoundly affect all the people you're talking mm. about and the wider. So I agree that there's a particular kind of focus that you and I do that most people don't do, right? And don't want to do. And in the same way that we don't want to do brain surgery, we don't want to be park keepers, all sorts of absolutely essential things that mm. are necessary for the society. You know, we're in our little niche that requires a particular kind of very narrow spotlight focus yeah. for very long periods of time. So we're at the extreme end of the spectrum of wanting and needing that. But for everyone, if attention breaks down, that achievement of goals and problem solving starts to go to shit. And that, I think, is the element that affects. Does that ring true to you? Or tell me if it, it doesn't. Does. Really no, that's very interesting. And I, I, I think that's quite, that's quite right. And for those of us who, who do treasure those um, flow states, it is quite frightening to imagine that they might disappear, that you can no longer access them. Um, uh, <clears throat> and I, I, I'm quite interested in things like Tom Daly's knitting, you know, mm. as a sort of displacement activity where it's, it's both relaxed and concentrated because yeah. uh, another side of my life is occasionally prancing about on stage, acting um, or, or performing in one way or another. And um, th th you know the, the, the way uh, sports people talk about being in the zone, um, a, a strange equivalent of the few, of, of the, not the fugue state, the flow state <laughs> that, that athletes have where if it's, let's say it's tennis, the, the ball just seems bigger and it moves more slowly and you can move to it more easily. And mm. it's just inevitable that you, it just, everything seems right. And we can all watch it if we love sport, we can see it when Ronnie O'Sullivan's got it at the table or, or a batsman has it in form or a footballer is just absolutely gliding across. And it, in performance, it's the same thing. You're on stage, you have days and th th what's exciting about it is that you can't control it. Um, mm. There's a famous story about Laurence Olivier. In one of his performances, he was so brilliant that not only did the audience stand and cheer for, for 10 minutes, but the, the cast were just going like that. It was a particularly astonishing evening. And he, as soon as the curtain came down, he slammed off, uh, off stage and, 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 and shut his door and, and hid in his dressing room. And everyone said, what's wrong with Larry? He was brilliant. And they sent Frank Finley, who was the sort of second lead, to go and see what was wrong. And he knocked on the door and Larry said, go away. And they said, Larry, it's Frank. He said, go away. He said, but, but don't you know you were brilliant tonight? He said, of course I know. I don't fucking know why. And that's the point. Mm -hmm. You can't control these things. That, that if you're an artist or a creative figure or a sportsman, or basically if you're a human being, you have moments where you are just brilliant. You just fly and you have that flow state. But the next day you might not have it. And the, 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 you can be a annoyed like uh, like Olivier but you can also rely like Olivier on the fact that he had a technique which meant tomorrow he'd be fine he'd be very good and most people wouldn't notice the difference but he wouldn't be able to access that brilliance and 
Rowan Atkinson said to me many, many years ago, the only way you can be happy on stage is if you concentrate and relax. Uh, if you relax without concentrating, you're all over the place. If you concentrate without relaxing, you're stiff and unnatural. But if you can get them both together, concentration and relaxation, then everything flows and it all works. And that struck me as a very wise and 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 he is a very wise man, Rowan Atkinson. And 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 I've since noted the truth of it. There are moments when you just concentrate because you think, oh my God, I'm on stage, I have to concentrate. And and Lerman, and you know that you're overdoing it, you're overreaching and you're just being a bit stiff and you're trying too hard. And there are other moments where you think, sorry, oh, you know, you relax and you think, I just I'm not in the moment, as actors like to say. And it is about being present, isn't it? I love that. I think there's so many, I'm just thinking about it because there's so many, so many aspects of that because that importance of presence, um, <clears throat> presence is precisely the thing I'm most worried is breaking down. And there was a moment for me, the moment that instigated the writing of the book, if you're okay, I'll just tell that story. Quickly. Yeah, no, I'm just going to be because it, close after this. Because it, 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 it really, that fear about being present and that self-consciousness that sometimes people get on stage, um, I think that really speaks to this thing that happened. So I would put off writing this book for a long time. I didn't really want to think about my attention. I was worried about it. I didn't want to think about it. And I had a moment, I have a, a godson named Adam. I've slightly changed some details about him because I don't want to out him. Mm. Um, and when he was nine, he developed this freakishly intense obsession with Elvis. I never understood why, but he, and what was so cute is he didn't know it had become a cheesy cliche. So when he was singing Suspicious Minds oh. with all the, it was beyond adorable. And he kept getting me to tell him the story of Elvis's life, right? And I tried to skip over the bit at the end where he dies on the toilet. But one night I was tucking him in and he looked at me very intensely and he said, Johan, will you take me to Graceland one day? And I said, sure, I'll take you to Graceland. And the way that you tell nine-year-olds that, because you know yeah. tomorrow it'll be Legoland. A reason to believe you know. we all will be received. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Have you been to Graceland? You haven't? I have, yes. In fact, it wasn't in a, you, I think it's in a documentary, isn't it? Yes, I think it was. Yeah, of course it is. Yeah, of course. I, I knew that. I've seen it. Um, <laughs> so, it, I prom I, but I promised him and that I would definitely take him to Graceland. And I never thought of it again until 10 years later when everything had gone wrong. So he had dropped out of school when he was 15. By the time I'm talking about, he was 19. You can't see this, but we were literally sitting on the sofa just behind me there. And I was looking at him and, it, and he was, he seemed to spend all his time alternating between his iPad, his phone and his laptop. And his life was just this blur of YouTube, porn, Snapchat. Um, and it was like nothing still or serious could get any traction in his mind. It was like he was whirring at the speed of Snapchat. And we were sitting on that sofa I'm sorry for being emotional thinking about it. And oh. I was disgusted with myself because I was looking at my own phone and I was horrified by what was happening to him. And I suddenly remembered this moment all those years before. And I said to him, hey, let's go to Graceland. And he was like, what? He didn't even remember this. Of course he didn't yeah. remember this thing that I'd said to him. But I reminded him and I could see that the idea of breaking this numbing routine appealed to something in him. So I said, look, we'll go. We'll go all over the South. But you've got to promise me one thing, which is that when we're there, you'll leave your phone in the hotel during the day so that we can actually be present, like your actors on stage. Yeah. And he made the promise. And I think he was absolutely sincere. And two weeks later, we landed in New Orleans, which I know is a place you love as well. And we traveled around and we got, to, we got to Memphis. And when you arrive at the gates of Graceland now, this is even pre-COVID, there's no one um, to show you around. What happens is they hand you an iPad, you put in earbuds and the iPad talks to you. So it says, go left, go right. And it explains, narrates where you are. And, um, and, and everywhere you go, there's a digital representation of that place on the iPad. Yeah. So what happens is everyone walks around Graceland staring at this iPad, right? Yeah. And we're still walking around and I'm getting more, I, first I found it almost funny because but I'm trying to make eye contact with someone to go, oh, this is funny. We're the people who traveled thousands of miles and actually looked at the place we went to. And finally I made eye contact with a guy who was about to say it. And I realized he'd only looked away from the iPad to take a selfie. So we get to the jungle room, which was Elvis's favorite room in Graceland. And there was a Canadian couple standing next to us. I'll never forget this. And the husband turned to the wife and he said, honey, this is amazing. Look, if you swipe left, you can see the jungle room to the left. And if you swipe right, you can see the jungle room to the right. 
as opposed and, and to I, moving your neck. I, I literally <laughs> laughed out loud because I thought he was joking. And then I just realized they're just swiping back and forth. And I said to him, but hey, sir, there's an old fashioned form of swiping you could do. You could turn your head because we're actually in the jungle room. You don't, you don't have to look at digital representation. Look, we're actually there. And of course they thought I was insane and backed away. And I turned to my godson to sort of laugh about it. And he was standing in a corner looking through Snapchat because from the moment we arrived, he just could not. And I went up to him and I did the thing many people in parental positions have tried to do. I tried to physically grab the phone of him. And I said, I know you're afraid of missing out. This is guaranteeing you will miss out. You are not being present at your own life. You're not showing up for your yeah. own events. And that crisis of presence that is so bad for actors, I think there's something, I think that's a really interesting and fertile thing to think about in terms of that moment of self-consciousness as an actor, we're all living in that zone. We're not being present. Mm-hmm. You were about to go to Iceland. We were talking before we went online. And I'll never forget when I went to Iceland for the research for the book. Um, I went to the Blue Lagoon, which for people who don't know is this famously incredibly beautiful thermal spa. And even in the Blue Lagoon, famously the most relaxing place in the world, about literally half the people had fucking selfie sticks. <laughs> and I, there was someone next to me, a German, I'll never forget it, who was live streaming to Instagram from the Blue Lagoon. And you just want to scream. And I went to so many places. I'm going to see the Mona Lisa. And it was fascinating. It was anthropologically fascinating. What happens is people yeah. wrestle the way to the front. They take out their phone and do a selfie. With their back to the page. With their back to the Mona Lisa. Yeah. And, and I watched it for an hour and no one looked at it. And it actually weirdly feels now like her smile isn't so enigmatic. It's like her <laughs> going, why won't you all look at me like you used to? Right? <laughs> so this crisis of presence that you're describing is really deep in the culture. And I think yes. a lot of people will be uh, identifying with what you're saying. And that thing about you want to be relaxed, but focused, that's exactly the right mode we want to be in. And I think we're in a culture that is undermining our capacity to get into that very precious mental state. Brilliant. Well, let's bring some people in now. Let's ask uh, let's ask um, Rosie to come in and uh, moderate with some questions. Hi, she's Rosie. Been looking at Hi, the yeah. cats. Hi, Stephen. Well, that and Rosie, was... thank you for all your amazing work on setting this up yes. and for everything you do. You're such oh. a fabulous person. Well, that's very sweet of you. are fabulous too. <laughs> <laughs> I know we work together in the dim. Very nice to see you. Anyway, that was a simply great conversation and we have got masses of questions, but I want to, I want to ask one myself to both of you and it, it flows very much from what Johan was saying about being in Graceland, that I think this obsession with this, uh, with the internet like that has made people extraordinarily isolated. I'm always absolutely struck when you go into a restaurant or you see a couple at having supper and they're both on their phones and they're not talking to each other. And how much you think that that, this weird change in the way we relate to each other in the world is responsible for a lot of the, uh, you know, the problems that we get more and more about people, higher antidepressants, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I'd like both your views on that. Stephen, you've got- got uh, Yes, I mean, it is an interesting one. I mean, part of me, worries that we are making an exception of of the technology of today um, and remembers just how much um, people used to despise the novel, for example, in the 18th and early 19th centuries. Reading fiction was a brain rotting exercise that you were lost in a book and you were not able to think properly. If you were going to read, you should only read sermons and histories, as it says somewhere <laughs> in Jane Austen. But the idea of reading a book would turn you a bit like um, what she called Catherine Morland, is it in in um, uh, uh, Northanger Abbey? You know, you yeah. become uh, you you mix up into the fiction that you read, and you start seeing people as melodramatic Gothic villains when they're perfectly ordinary nice people because you've you've been sucked into the terrible plotting of a of a novel. <laughs> List, which which uh, which basically steals the soul of of the reader, and then it became uh, uh, you know TV or radio, in fact, and then TV and cinema, and so on, have all had this, and then video games, and now the internet, and so there. Are, uh, other people will say it goes all the way back. I think you quote Socrates's distrust of writing <laughs> things down, um, that writing as a technology, which it is. Uh, also steals people's memories and stops them being able to focus properly on uh, human interaction because they're they're reading and they're you know they're not in the moment they're they're not in the human moment so there is a part of me 
feel sympathetic to that view and mm -hmm. very optimistic about the human brain because they think the the complete and perfect plasticity of the human brain is a, I, I still wonder I stand in a field in Norfolk uh, and uh, far away there's a copse or a standing you know some standing trees and a little bit of wind will turn the leaf of one of them so that it becomes silvery and my eye immediately goes towards it uh, it's an ancient human instinct something has moved somewhere far away in the middle of the countryside it might be lunch or it might be something that thinks of me as lunch so we are instantly aware of this tiny thing that's happened but two hours later I've caught a train and I'm in Oxford Street and I'm on the phone and I'm walking down the street. I'm talking to someone, having a completely coherent conversation while skipping out of the way of traffic and other pedestrians and music and people and thousands of colours and all kinds of noise and visual jumbled information is coming towards me. But I filter it out perfectly and carry on with my conversation. The brain is astounding and it's going to take a little bit more than the internet to destroy it. So that's partly what I think. <laughs> I think there's so many things that's beautifully put. Really I think that's, that's, yeah. yeah, and I think I thought a lot about um, those issues you just raised, Stephen, because of course there's, for a long time, I'd, some of my friends have actually been reminding me in the last few weeks that when these issues were raised, I would always say, well, this is a moral panic, right? There's plenty of changes that have happened in the past. Yeah where people think, oh, it's this is a disaster, you know, whether it's, I mean, I remember when I was a teenager. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and then, so there are sometimes moral panics where people get very concerned about things that turn out to be benign. Equally, there are historical analogies where people were very concerned about something and they were absolutely right to be concerned and we should have listened early. The climate crisis, the obesity crisis, all sorts of other factors. Mm -hmm. So what we have to do is weigh carefully, is this a moral panic or is it a real concern and I think the, the the book analogy you give the novel the, the counter the critique of the novel that begins obviously when novels become popular um I thought a lot about that and I interviewed someone called Professor Raymond Marr in Toronto who's done this fascinating research basically he has shown that reading novels significantly boosts your empathy because it is a simulated social universe. Mm. And it turns out that I'm reading a lot of Anita Bruckner at the moment, who I've become completely obsessed mm. with. And you read Anita Bruckner, anyone, by the way, listening, if you haven't read Anita Bruckner, oh my God, go and read Anita Bruckner. You know but, she was um, a spy as well, do you? What? Yeah, she, she? did work for MI6. No, right, I want to hear amazing. all about this afterwards. Yeah. Oh my God, that, that makes it even more amazing <laughs> to me. But the, you, you know, Anita Bruckner describes essentially lonely old people you, you read that and then you see a lonely old person in the street and you feel so differently because then you've simulated. And Professor Ma, uh, what he showed is in-depth engagements with simulated social universes enhance your empathy. And that is breaking down for the first time in the entire history of the American Republic. Um, most Americans now do not read a single work of fiction. Um, now that, so you can see, and I think, there are all sorts of assets and good things about TikTok, but it's not a simulated social universe in the way that a novel is. It's not a sustained, yeah. long engagement. I think the other thing about you said about plasticity, which is so fascinating, brain plasticity, the brain is staggeringly plastic and there are limits on that plasticity, as I know you agree as well. And it was fascinating talking to people like Professor Earl Miller. What are the limits of our plasticity? There's a really interesting, simple set of science that shows this. You can train almost anyone to speed read. It, even professional speed readers can be trained to read better, but it always comes with a cost. The faster you read, the more simplistic the things you choose, the less you remember and the less you understand. So you can plastic, you, you, you can you can use brain plasticity to read extraordinarily fast, but it comes with a cost. And I think the plasticity you're describing, which is incredible, and of course, one of the reasons why our species is so successful, um, that plastic usually the gain one place comes with a cost somewhere else mm. which is not to say that we don't necessarily want to make those trade-offs of course it may mm. be that we choose okay we want less attention but more speed but i think we the plasticity is you have a certain amount of brain power and if it goes in one place it's not going to go another it's a slightly simplistic way of putting yeah. it but the you know what i mean yeah that's very good 
There we I are. I also feel like you are one of the few people I know who speaks fast enough. Whenever we talk, I know we talk really, really quickly. And we sound like we just want to go really back. Yeah, boy. And I know I speak really <laughs> fast too. Okay, we've got so many questions. Sorry, sorry. Let, me, let me move on. Now, Tom Lawton asks a good question. Shoshana Zuboff, who, who wrote mm. School of Capital, points out that it is not the tech per se that causes the problem. It's the big tech companies' business models. They are dependent on our lack of attention. And I mean, I would say, you know, what Stephen and you were saying about the obesity crisis, it's not the individual's fault, it's the system. Mm -hmm. So how, as Tom asks here, how can we take action as it's such an asymmetrical fight, which I would wholly agree with. Do you mind if I do that, take that first, Stephen? I'll just yeah. do it quickly. Please do. Please. There's a historical analogy that I think will really help us to think about this. Um, and people, Rosie and Stephen, you'll both remember this, I remember it. Uh, it used to be very normal for people to paint their homes with lead paint and to use leaded petrol in their cars. And then it was discovered, it was in fact known as far back as ancient Rome, that exposure to lead profoundly damages people's ability to focus and pay attention, particularly children. And by the 1970s, there was basically a huge denial industry funded by the lead industry of disputing the science. But by the 1970s, it was completely clear that this was the case. So what did we do? We didn't ban paint and we didn't ban petrol. We banned the lead in the petrol. And I think in the, we use that, and there was a big movement to do that. And I think in the historical analogy, you're absolutely right. And Professor Zuboff, who's a complete hero, is absolutely right that the equivalent of the lead in the lead paint, sorry, the equivalent of the lead in the paint is the current business model. Current business model is very simple. Every time you pick up your phone, Facebook, TikTok, a lot of them make more money. The longer you scroll, the more money they make. So as I was taught by many of the leading dissidents in Silicon Valley who've designed this world, all of their engineering power, all of their algorithmic might is geared towards one thing. How do we get you and your kids to pick up your phone more and scroll longer? And Asa Raskin, who designed a key part of how the internet works, said to me, look, the solution to this is very simple. You need to ban that business model, just like we ban lead in paint. Just say we will not permit a business model that is based on invading our attention, hacking our attention and selling it to the highest bidder for advertisers. There are other business models that we all know about, subscription, public ownership, independent of government, there's a whole range of business models, where if we have those business models, suddenly these things can be redesigned not to maximally hack and invade your attention as they are now, as the companies themselves admit, but can be designed to heal your attention. But at the moment, we're in a race. On the one side, these technologies driven by this business model, which makes them a fortune, will only become more invasive right? Paul Graham, one of the leading investors in Silicon Valley, said the world will become more addictive in the next 40 years than it, is in, than it was in the last 40 years. Think about how much more addictive TikTok is to a child than Facebook. Okay. On the other side, we've got to have a movement of all of us saying, no, you're not allowed to do this. We will not permit you to do this to us and our children. And getting rid of that business model and taking lots of the other steps that I talk about in the book. Does that ring true to you, Stephen? Immensely so, yes. I mean, it's very interesting that in a way it's, it's a, it reflects one of the major divisions between groups of people and ways of thinking. And that is the individualist way of thinking, uh, mm. which at its big extreme is libertarianism and Ayn Rand and, mm. and uh, a belief that government should never interfere in, in business and in, in the way uh, successful people behave. And on the other hand, the furthest extreme collectivism and communism and so on. But in between, there is a sort of fight between uh, people who believe that interfering with business and, and, and laying down the law as to, uh, especially in areas like uh, as apparently nebulous as attention seeking and uh, so on, um, is the nanny state gone mad and others see uh, the Facebook's business model and, and uh, YouTube, which is Google, of course, um, uh, as being capitalism or unfettered uh, a business gone mad and as we know for other reasons and part of them are similar but there is very little middle ground now so you're either one or the other and people therefore are very find it very difficult because you have those making a fuss saying these businesses have to learn you have to have regulation and whether it's the eu trying to to regulate or whether it's uh, america american congress and uh, trying to lay down laws they, they, they can be wriggled out of, and there'll always be people who say it's not our business to tell 
uh, a, a large company how mm. how to run itself and the, the market will decide but we have to find a way of being strong and it's like the climate crisis in that sense mm. that um somehow without alienating the 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 great middle who are confused as we all are really to be honest without alienating them with our self-righteousness and our anger um and without sounding like uh kind of um anarchists <laughs> we, <laughs> we 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 have to argue a case reasonably uh for some sort of control and to me there are different ways of doing it but I can't help but look at, you know, if Shakespeare were around in a hundred years time, he might write a play about Mark Zuckerberg, about the absolute <laughs> tragedy of how a human being can become one of the 10th richest people on the planet and not say, okay, we've reached this point. Now let's make Facebook one of the most benevolent institutions mm. the world has ever seen. We've got all this power, mm. all this fantastic sum of money. It's perfectly clear. The whole world has agreed that what we do is dangerous and deleterious to human comity. It is a bad thing. It is resulting in bad things. It has caused all kinds of fascism and violence and, and conspiracy theories and unpleasantness and deep, deep harm to the body politic and to the world of people. And wouldn't it be fun for Nick Clegg and others <laughs> at Facebook to say, let's now reverse this. Yeah. We used to say, move fast and break things, which is what the, the, the mantra of, of Silicon Valley was. Well, they've broken things and things mm -hmm. are now broken. Now they must move fast and mend things. And mm -hmm. they have all the money and all the resources and all the technology in the world to focus their technologies on something good. And as you've said in your book, it's surprisingly simple to tweak those algorithms mm. and to tweak the business model into a subscription model like Netflix, say. So I say, well, okay, I'll pay, a, you know, whatever it is, 20 pounds a year to, to have the advantages that Facebook can give me. And no longer will there be any advertisements mm. because there are no advertisements on Netflix. Mm. Um, yeah. You don't need them. No advertisements on the BBC. Uh, anyway, sorry. <laughs> Steve, Such a good answer. That's so interesting. And, you know, at the moment, there's just all the stuff going through Parliament about just creating a watershed for not having high fat, sugar, salt food yes. and uh, during children's television programmes. And, you yes. know, they're kicking up really rough about saying, you know, the, that they'll go broke if they don't have this. Now, listen, we're nearly out of time. Oh, no. and, I mean, I just want to that we've had an awful lot of questions that are about so people, sorry. We've been... No, no, no. People <laughs> writing about their kids. No, it's flown by. Yeah. I, I'm just yeah. going to take one question here from Jeffrey Beam. But thank you all to everybody else who asked questions similar vein. Um, he said, thank you to you both. How do we encourage our children, like my 13 year old Elliot, to build healthy habits and practices uh, in a tech in a pandemic, but basically in a tech drowning era? And I, I think this has come up so often through the questions which we've had so many and, and thank you all so much for them. So can I get both your views? On I'll start so we can finish with our hero, John Johan. Um, I just quickly say I have 13 godchildren, nephews and nieces and them. so on. And it breaks my heart that only one of them is actually interested in reading books. Oh. Um, well, well, one of them reads nonfiction quite a lot, but very few of them read literature or have any sense of what a novel can do and what a short story can do and, and of the power and beauty and majesty of the written word and how it can take one to all kinds of places and and a part of me feels like a stupid old-fashioned bossy figure giving them I've given up giving them books for Christmas and birthdays because I know they don't read them and are not interested so even trying to get them to be interested in the golden age of Hollywood is if it's black and white they won't they're not interested and of course books are written in black and white and good movies are often in black and white so uh, what I do is um, is tell them tell them the stories. I, I mean, I started to tell one of my uh, godchildren several years ago the story of crime and punishment, and then stopped just before he gets spoiler alert to murder. <laughs> Eighteen sixty four, um, but we did one. <laughs> yeah, I stopped and I said a crime is about to be committed, and he said, "Well, what?" 
And I said, you have to read the book now. <laughs> Genius. <laughs> that's, that's the best I could do. And it's not what much. Happens? Not. You can't leave us on that cliffhanger. Did he read the book? He did read the book. I'm glad I to thought you were going to say what it. happened with Raskolnikov. But then Paris. did not read the Brothers Karamazov or any other book. So. That's so <laughs> interesting. And as you know, I've, Stephen, I've been lobbying you to write more novels because I absolutely love your novel wow. making history. And um, But that, that's a brilliant way of putting it. And I think, so the last quarter of the book, is about our children and children's tension problems. For every one child who was diagnosed with attention problems when I was seven, there's now a hundred children given that diagnosis. And for some of them, there's a biological component to that problem for many of those kids. But also, it's not a coincidence that this huge rise in children's attention problems has happened at the same time as an enormous transformation of childhood. My parents grew up in very different places, a Scottish tenement and a Swiss village. They left home but when they were five years old, they walked to school on their own with their friends and they would leave school on their own and they would wander around with the other kids and they would go home when they were hungry. That is what childhood was for almost all of human history. Children played freely with other children. And it turns out there's many aspects in the free play of children that are essential for developing attention and focus. Let's think about an absolute no shit Sherlock one, which is one of those ones where you wonder why social scientists need to prove it, but there's a, a lot of evidence. Physical exercise is essential for children to develop healthy brains. One of the single best things you can do for kids who are struggling to focus is let them go around, run around and come back. Um, children exercise far less than they used to. Children need to roam and explore. And we have, even before COVID, we effectively put children under house arrest. Yes, Only... Jonathan Haidt and uh, the coddling exactly. of the American mind. Yeah, And as, 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 as Jonathan Haidt says in that book and presents the evidence, by 2003, only 10% of children ever played outside without adult supervision. One of the tragedies of COVID is that it didn't change as much as you think because they were already, obviously it made it worse. Mm. They were already prisoners. And, there's, and um, one of the heroes in my book is a woman called Lenore Skenazi, who runs a group called Let Grow. Because you can tell parents that, but you can't be the only person sending your kid out to play. Then they just get frightened. You look like a nutter. It doesn't work. So what Lenore does is go to whole schools and whole communities and persuade them to restore childhood. She asked them, what's something you loved to do when you were a kid that you don't let your own children do? And it was un one of the most moving experiences I had for the book was going to places where this program had begun. So I'll give you one example. In, in Long Island, I went to a school that had let, that had done this, they, this Let Grow program. And there was a boy, big strapping 14 year old boy, who until this program began, had never been allowed out on his own by his parents. They wouldn't even let him jog around the block. And his phrase was, now this is a fancy town in Long Island where the French bakery is across the street from the olive oil stop, <laughs> shop. And he said, my parents wouldn't let me out because they're worried about all these kidnappings. He had a level of fear that would be appropriate if he lived at the height of Pablo Escobar's terror in Medellin, right? Uh, whereas in fact, he's three times more likely to be hit by lightning than kidnapped. And then this program began and him and his friends started to go out together and they went to the woods and they built a fort with their own hands. And they went to that fort without their phones because they didn't have any reception there and they enjoyed going there. And when I saw him talk about it, it was like watching a child come to life. You could see him becoming something bigger than he was. And, and Lenore said to me, you know, think about human history. For all of human history, humans had to go out explore forage play and then we stopped all of that and then that boy given a chance went into the woods and he built a fort and at the moment the only way our children get to roam around is on video games right if you're on Fortnite, at least you get to feel you're exploring something if you take away exploration from children you can't be surprised when they become obsessed with the one form of exploration we do permit them so a big part of we've got what we've got to do is restore a human childhood that our ancestors, that your grandparents and mine would have recognized as a childhood. But what we're providing now, set aside the debate about COVID and lockdowns, but what we're providing now is not what the humans before us would have recognized as childhood, right? So we've, we, we, yeah, hooray. That is superb. Yeah. I think we do have to end it there. Oh, but sorry. That is absolutely no, brilliant yeah, way to end it. So Stephen, Stephen and Johan, but, um, details of oh. both your books, Stolen Focus and Prize Ties, 
are on the chat, um, please go go buy them. Um, I can't thank you both enough. That was completely fascinating. I'm really sorry to everyone whose questions we couldn't come to, yeah. but get the book, think about it. And I hope this has engaged you as much as it's engaged me. And yes, we've all got a lot to do. I very much <laughs> like Stephen's idea that you know the big tech guys should now say, We've made this weird thing, now let's get it right. I think that's what we should be looking for. It's very beautifully said, Stephen. So Thanks. thank you very much. Uh, we'll be back next week. We've got Michael Ignatieff and a fantastic lineup of people in a kind of traditional five by 15. So hope to see as many of you there and good night to you both. And thank, thank you both. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Rosie. Thank you, You're you and thank you, Johan. I'll oh. be in touch with oh. everybody. Bye, Bye. everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Bye.